takes a particular kind of courage for a soldier to condemn his own actions in battle, to risk a backlash from his fellow troops, all the more so, perhaps, if the army he fought for was Israel's and the conflict was in Gaza. International condemnation made domestic dissent a rarity until tonight. That's what three young Israeli reservists express in our special report tonight, made by the Israeli filmmaker Norit Kader. They were part of the force whose invasion left 1,400 Palestinians and 13 Israelis dead. They were plucked from their teenage lives, their clubs, their discos, their music, and transported to the front line. Alex Thompson has their stories, which do contain some strong language. I felt like a boy in a Spielberg film. Wow, so many soldiers and everybody moving forward. You feel like you're a part of some terrifying power. It's fun. It gives you a good feeling. I knew it would be difficult to keep some morality, and I didn't succeed. I killed people, and that was wrong. There was an atmosphere of stressing us out as much as possible, as if they wanted to push people to some place where they would do anything more easily, that they wouldn't care as much about who they were shooting or what they were shooting at. Our battalion commander got up to speak. We were waiting for him to give us some information and tell us what's going to happen. We knew we were going in the next day. And he said, the sentence still echoes in my head to this day. He said that the entry was going to be disproportionate. Those words are still in my mind. And so at this point we knew what we were getting into, that the entry would be disproportionate in terms of firepower. There'd be huge numbers of ground forces going in. No soldiers from the IDF have ever spoken on camera before about just what happened on what they called Operation Cast Lead. The Israeli filmmaker Nurit Kedar persuaded some to speak out for the first time about what they did for their country. We entered the city in a big hullabaloo, shooting like crazy. None of us knew what we were shooting at. There were those who shot at mosques. As far as I was concerned, if they didn't shoot at me from a specific mosque, then I had no reason to harm someone's religion. The order was very clear. If a car came within 200 meters of me, I could simply shoot. Shoot a shell at it. We needed to cleanse the neighborhoods, the buildings, the area of the neighborhood. It sounds really terrible to say cleanse. But those were the orders. I don't want to make a mistake with the words. I don't remember if it was the squadron or the battalion commander. But with a laser, he simply marked for us the line of homes that were to be hit. He said clearly, every house gets a shell. That was the assignment, and it was our job, the tanks, to do it. The Israeli Air Force claims it has now hit more than a thousand targets. This is an ongoing long war against terror. On Gaza streets, ambulance crews rush to their latest call. Every time we got out of our tanks, there was always this thing of comparing who'd killed more. It was completely disgusting. All the time they'd come and say, great, we heard you killed two yesterday. And I was like, what's great? That's something good? It's not good. The crump of tank shells can be heard landing every few minutes, along with the rattle of machine gun fire. And thousands of troops are now engaged. We would fire a shell onto the top of the building and a shell at the bottom. This is what caused all the civilians to leave, with white flags in the dark at night. Families with children, without anything, without bags, with no preparation. The moment the building got the second shell, 
I would watch the procession of the family leaving the building. The tanks was here, and we leave the house and uh, walk. There, uh, there no car. We, we, when we uh, go out the house, we don't know where we go. Uh, we walk, walk, and walk, and walk in the dark. And uh, they uh, shot. They, they was shoot, shooting uh, and uh, bombing in, at night. Uh, my kids was crying. And I am crying. You'd see this procession of a family and it shocked me. Where had they been until now? Where had they been hiding? Why didn't they come out right at the start? Why did they wait during those days of fighting? When you see it for the first time, with the stick of wood and the white flag attached, the white flag that they carried, with all the children and all the babies, it doesn't matter. You'd call your soldiers to go out and look at it. But on the other hand, you'd be terribly alert. You'd follow them with your eyes, and you'd have your hand on the trigger. They have houses. We have houses. Why? Why? As soldiers do the world over, these men took photographs of their tour of duty inside Gaza. Images of young Israeli men barricaded inside Palestinian homes, graffiti on the walls. Here, beneath the Star of David, it says, Am Israel Chai, long live the people of Israel. There's an almost festive atmosphere in some of the pictures. On the family, photographs on the walls of the house, on the faces of the children, they'd drawn glasses and moustaches. They'd been writing things on the walls, and they'd use all the clothes of this family to cover up the windows. You need clothes, of course, to darken the house. And all the time we were there, you could sense this family with us. I think I was in Zaytun. I don't remember exactly, but it was a house a few stories high. On the second floor there were some terrorists shooting and throwing down grenades at us. I aimed well and I fired. But there were 30 seconds before that when I was looking at him, and many thoughts ran through my mind. It was that this person is also fighting at this moment for something, and that he's in exactly the same situation as me. And that there isn't so much difference between him and me. I really looked him in the eye. He couldn't see me, of course, because I was looking at him through the viewfinder. But I watched him for half a minute. I've just remembered something else. When we left Gaza, I left a letter for the family. For the family in Gaza where we were, in the house, I left them a letter on the door saying that we're sorry for all we did. Although we had no choice and that we went there to protect our families, but that we were sorry for all the mess and what we'd left. And that one day, I hope we can live in this land as neighbors. I feel good. I'm proud of what I did. No one can tell me that I'm a war criminal because I know what I did, what my friends did, and what the people around me did, and what the targets were that I received from my commanders. So no one can tell me or my friends that we're war criminals. I'll never forget that two-story building and the 30 seconds I had eye contact with that guy. I shot him half a minute later. It's something I'll never forget. It's hard to forget something like that. My wife and my mum had a surprise for me. What surprise? Well, my mum had bought me a new plasma TV. So I entered our home and saw the new telly. Now I'm not mad on television, but my mum thought I'd be so happy to see the plasma. They'd hung up new shelves and painted the walls. They'd fixed up the house so that I returned to a renovated home. 
all clean, newly decorated. And I stood and looked at the house, and I just couldn't accept it. I wouldn't agree to this because at that moment, I saw the house that we had left in Gaza and the family. Of course, their house remained, but most of the neighborhood where that house stood was gone now. And I knew that when that family returned to that house in Gaza, what would they see? All the shit, all their clothes, all the beds where the soldiers with their shoes had been sleeping, all the holes in the walls, all their clothes torn up, the smell of the soldiers with our weapons. And here I am, in a new house, renovated with a plasma TV. And it's at this point that everything changed. The pain began to come, the sadness, and the tears. 